How can analytics help us avoid the next Quentin Johnson or Traylon Burks? With the draft less than 20 days away, we've brought on Dwayne McFarland of Fantasy Life to help us avoid these pitfall players. We've talked about the film, we've talked about the stats, now we're diving deeper than ever before. We're going to get into Dwayne's amazing rookie wide receiver model, compare the results with Rich's incredible model that he's built, and we're going to dig into some wide receivers that stand out for one reason or another. Dwayne, are you just ready for the NFL draft now? I am. I am. I'm finishing up uh, the running back model this week, so the model's done. It's calibrated. I'm my fingers have been typing, you know, before I got on the show today. So yeah, that stuff will all come out early next week. But once that's done, I'm through all the prospects, and yeah, now I'll just be waiting for a, uh, you know, I'm sure like Rich will be like, what are the landing spots? What kind of draft capital these guys? And then we'll update everything after the draft. Yeah, it's kind of like there's going to be another complete deluge of fantasy fallout after that draft, and then everything slows down slightly. But we have got lots to get into, so let's get straight to it. Um, the first player we're going to talk about tonight is Roma Dunze. Rich, I'm going to come to you first on a Dunze because I know in your version of the model without draft capital, Adunze is your wide receiver seven. And we're going to mainly focus on the versions of models where you and Dwayne have got projected draft capital in them. But Rich, what is it that's pulling Roma Dunze down for you outside of draft capital? It's it's not that there's anything massively that pulls him down. It's that there's nothing that massively kind of pulls him up, if that makes sense. He's kind of good, solid, above average in everything, but but great in nothing. Um, so, you know, he's he's 60th percentile receiving yards per team pass attempt. He's 80th percentile PPR breakout percentile. He's uh, tw- he's 60th percentile target percentage, 85th percentile draft age. Like, like he's, he's good. The problem is, is that analytically in my profile, he's just not incredible if that makes sense so that's where he he falls down slightly in the the pre-draft capital model for me so fair enough um Dwayne uh, how strong a prospect do you view Dunze as analytically compared to, like the wide receivers we've seen over the last few years yeah well I think Rich is actually right so like if I, I've got a version of my model as well that does not have draft capital in it and like where I really want to be with all my models is ultimately like that without draft capital at all, that the model's already strong. And the wide receiver model's close, like running back's already there. Like running back without even having draft capital in it, like it's stronger than NFL draft capital. But wide receivers, like there's still some things I'm trying to figure out uh, with with the model and different things that I've been testing. It's like, I kind of understand where there are spots in the model where I could have blind spots. And I worked on some of those things this off season, but just to you know, kind of go along with what Rich was saying, like he's a 72nd percentile prospect in the model without draft capital right and i use draft capital um based on like the chase stewart um chart so it's kind of like the jimmy johnson chart so a draft pick is not just one two three four five linear right it's worth way more at pick one gets way less down to about pick 64 and once you get to there like it flattens out so once you add draft capital in for a guy that you think you know right now is going as high as odunze is it does shoot him way up the board but i talked about this in my write up around odunze look I really like him, but I think people that are saying, oh, no, he should be graded next to Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors. If you take away his draft capital, there's a big gap between those guys. So right now, like he's my 39th prospect uh, in my database back to 2018. If you look at Marvin Harrison without draft capital, he's still in the top five. CD Lamb is my number one without draft capital. So if you look at Malik Neighbors, he's still right there, too. He's still inside the top eight, you know, in the database. So. I, I pretty much agree with what Rich said. Like, there's no one single thing standing out that makes him really shoot way up the board other than his draft capital. Now, again, that's not to say he's bad. People get so bent out of shape about this. I still think he's a really good player. I think he is a complete wide receiver that can play on the outside. I think he can, I think he can challenge all three areas of the field. I just don't think he is as strong as the other two guys based on some similar things Rich is talking about, but um, I'm using a thing now that I call a uh, career adjusted Ripta. Hey, you can thank Ian Harditz. He calls uh, team, uh, receiving yards per team pass attempt Ripta. So I do podcasts with him. So I'm just going with it. So you guys, I'm stealing that. Not I love that. Point. That's so much better. <laughs> I, get, I get tired of saying it too. I was like, Ian, I can't say this anymore. He's like Ripta. I was like, cool. I'm going with Ripta. We're just going to call it that, but it's receiving yards per team passing attempt. But I created an adjustment on that this year that's based off of average depth of target, 
quarterback play and your teammates, how good they are. So that all goes into the model. And then there's also an adjustment for it in age. And it is the most powerful metric in my model from a production standpoint. And you do have Romo Dunze falling behind Malik neighbors and Marvin Harrison didn't break out as early. His breakout was not as big. Even his breakout when it came a little later, year four was really his, was his biggest season. And in my model, you don't get as many, you, it doesn't weight as heavily. To, to year four. The data tells us the years one, two, and three are the most important years as far as future fantasy production. So could, do, go, go on, Rich. I'll let you cut. Could, a... I, I know you've got the show planned out. I don't want to throw us off, off kilter immediately, yeah, but I'm okay. really keen to, to pick right. Dwayne's brain on one thing. <laughs> so Roma Dunze specifically, obviously with Washington 2020 season, they hardly played. So for me, I have some thresholds that he didn't clear early on in his career, partly because he he hardly played and Washington had played, I think it was four games in his freshman year. Does that pay into him being slightly lower for you because of that almost full start in his freshman year? Yeah. So with the, with the COVID stuff, I'm giving a little more leniency. I'll be happy, honestly, Rich, when that is really in the rear view 100%. and I don't have to worry about that. It's a, it's a, it's COVID was annoying in many worse ways, but for us nerds, like it was also an, it, it continues to be in an annoyance right now because of this. So all my data is based on a, a game by game basis. So I don't, it, it's fine. I'm just, I'm allowing a smaller sample size in, into my sample for that year for COVID. Like typically you have to play at least six games. Um, but for that COVID season, I'm letting it, I'm, I'm letting it go at four because we had a lot of teams play four. So it's, it's giving Romo Dunze credit for being out there, but he just wasn't that great. Even in the small sample, I, I know it's not as strong, but I still think it's better than nothing. Like just giving everyone a pass on that year because we did, uh, we had some teams that did manage to play enough games. So it kind of create, creates a conundrum for us when we're trying to like level the playing field and really grade all these guys against one another. But yes, he just didn't break out until really he was later. And my model has totally moved away from thresholds just because I think they're fine, but I've always had these, like, I literally will dream about this missing players that just barely are missing thresholds. So now like I've put them, everything's on a spectrum, right? Nothing's binary. Yes or no. You made this threshold or you didn't because we know that's not the way it works. Things can be somewhere in between. But Odunze overall, like even once you take all those factors into play, he was he was good. Hear me, folks. Please don't like at me and kill me on social media. He is good, but he is not in the same ballpark as the other two guys. Yeah, and if you've listened to anything that Ben Gretsch has done this offseason, you'll have heard him talk about how a lot of the Washington players went back to chase chase that national championship, and they were kind of right to do it in some ways. So I think there's definitely some real world stuff going in there on a Dunze. Uh, but we will move on from him before we spend too much time talking about just one of the very best players in the draft. If you're finding us on Fantasy Sanctuary for the first time, hit that subscribe button down below. We've got so much rookie content coming throughout the next couple of weeks in the run-up to the draft. Some really great guests coming on. We've got loads more stuff after the draft. Best ball season's ramping up. We'll have at least two shows a week on best ball. It's going to be a great time to be a subscriber to the Fantasy Sanctuary. Xavier Worthy. I mean, in terms of interesting players in this draft, Xavier Worthy is absolutely one of those who just stands out like Dwayne your model score for Worthy has him at 59% which is a fairly substantial drop from the next player above him Brian Thomas at 70% he pops in touchdowns per games and in uh, Ripta as you put it adjusted receiving yards per team pass attempt but how concerned are you about any of the factors that create that gap between him and the tier with Brian Thomas in yeah. So, I mean, with Brian Thomas, so one of the things in the model is pedigree. And so he's coming from LSU, a school that we we know has really put out great high end wide receivers. Um, I also look at other skill players and that goes back to 2014. So honestly, that's where the big bump is coming from. So like if you play at Texas and you're a running back, like that looks a little better for you. But if you're a wide receiver until this year where we've got Adonai Mitchell, obviously the transfer from Georgia and you got Xavier worthy, like we've got Devin Duvernay. So the model does care about pedigree. And the reason why is because the NFL cares about it too. Like the NFL, like the thing that overlaps the most with draft capital, because I test all of my variables against each other to see where the overlap is to decide, Hey, do I kick something out of the model? Do I need to turn something into a composite score to make sure I'm not like double weighting something? 
And pedigree is huge for the NFL. <laughs> like if they're scouting one thing, it's probably the logo on the side of a helmet more than anything else. And so with Worthy, that's really the thing, you know, that's also getting him a little bit in the model. But I, I have those two guys pretty close. Um, and the other thing to remember with the model, once you include draft capital, because I am using, you know, the Chase Stewart version where I'm now converting a draft pick into a value, you know, there's that big drop off. So when you'll you'll see somebody start off like Marvin Harrison's at 100th percentile in the model. I know we'll eventually get to that, but like he's the top player ever in the model. Well, you look at Xavier Worthy and you think 59th percentile. Wow, that's terrible. But if you go look at all the players in the model, and I've made them all available for you over at fantasylife.com, you guys can check it out. There's a selector, a drop down. You can look at any class you want, or you can just say, all, oh, show me all these guys, put them all together. Um, had a lot of requests for that last year. You'll notice, like, once you get to the 59th percentile, you're still fairly high in the list. Like, it's once you get lower than, once you start getting down into the 30s and 40s, where you get a huge bolus, you know, of players and the model. So 59th percentile isn't terrible. To your point, though, it is lower than what we have with Brian Thomas Jr. The biggest thing is pedigree. But, like, with Worthy, obviously, there's the size. Um, the supermodel doesn't really care about his size, to be honest, as long as you're not, I mean, he's right at that threshold. And it's just because the league's changing, you know, I, I would rather him be 10 pounds heavier, but it's not really hurting him in the model. But the thing with Xavier worthy, like is man, he broke out in a big way really early. So his freshman season, his Ripta was great. Um, if you look at what he did the following years, yeah, it wasn't cr quite as good, but still really good numbers. So his career numbers are good in the model. And then the things that concern me about smaller players. So where I like kind of go look for context is okay, can they beat man coverage? And so if you look at his targets per route run versus man coverage, 32%. That is one of the best in the class. Uh, I've heard people say, well, he gets too many targets around the line of scrimmage. Yeah, he got 25% of his targets behind the line of scrimmage, but he also had 28% of his looks come 20 plus yards downfield. The average NCAA receiver is at 20%. So this is a guy that really you can deploy all over the field I do think the main question is his size, but he's already shown that he can beat man coverage. I think it's it would be optimal, like if he lands with an offensive coordinator that acknowledges some of this and does move him around the formation or at least stacks him in formations. But I, I, I'm not totally afraid to see Xavier Worthy line up one-on-one -on -one and have to beat press coverage. I don't know that you want him doing that all the time, but I do think he's good enough to be out there and he can be a player that you can really use in all aspects uh, of, of the game, especially the way the game is getting played today. So I think Xavier Worthy is one of these players people are mostly discounting because of the size. But like, look recently, and we've had Tank Dell, we've had Devonta Smith. I mean, the NFL's changing. Uh, it's, it's just the way the game gets played and the way it's spaced out. And, and the biggest thing is coaches are more open to it. Because that used to be the barrier. Ten years ago, Xavier Worthy wouldn't rank this high just because there's no way. We couldn't trust a coach to trust him and say, oh, I'm going to play him. They would just automatically think, oh, no, he's not He's not big enough. He can't play. But I think we're coming out of that, especially as we get a new generation of coaches in the league. And I think that's really good for these space kind of players uh, like Xavier Worthy. But to be clear, this guy can win at all levels. He doesn't, have, he doesn't just have to be scheme touches. So just just one question. You can see on screen part of your rookie model from fantasylife.com, which people should be going and checking out. It's linked in the description below. But we've got Xavier Worthy projected for the 31st pick, Brian Thomas for the 17th pick. Is there a situation if Xavier Worthy was being projected for, say, the 24th pick and Brian Thomas was the 21st pick? Is there anything in Xavier Worthy's model that would bring him above him in model score or do you it feel could like get, he's a it could get really close really fast uh in the model in the pre-draft model uh like the one rich was talking about that you guys have 0. 0.76 is the score for brian thomas jr and 0. 0.74 for xavier worthy so right. i mean that they're barely separated you know I, I would still favor thomas a little bit because he does have the size factor working to his advantage but I think right now, and Rich, I'm interested in your thought. I think Xavier Worthy is a more complete wide receiver. Brian Thomas, is he ran a lot of short routes that people don't realize, like hitches, things like that. And then he was also a deep threat. So I think he deserves a little more credit. Some people just look at him as a deep threat only. But the hole in his game is where a lot of money is made in the league, and it's in the intermediate area. And that is where route running becomes really important. It's about, it's not just speed. You know, it's the nuance of setting up the break that you want to set up so that you can get to the right spot. Let's face it, the league runs coverage, uh, zone coverage 70% of the time. 
So you've got to understand all those things and you've got to know how to manipulate and create that space between defenders. I think Xavier Worthy is already more capable of that than Brian Thomas Jr. I don't think it's even a conversation that Worthy's a more complete receiver yeah. than Brian Thomas. I think Brian Thomas does two things really well. He's a big bodied outside receiver that can go deep, that wins contested catches, that tracks the ball really well. And he's good with the ball in his hands. He doesn't have the nuanced route running. He doesn't have the body control in and out of breaks. He is going to be almost like a DK Metcalf in his rookie year, where DK Metcalf was literally run a nine, run a post, run a comeback, and that is it. And then once you've kind of got settled in the NFL, we can grow from there. That That's incredibly valuable because those are some of the most valuable routes. You know, Brian Thomas can line up as a true X, beat press coverage and go and do that. Xavier Worthy can be moved all over the field can be used at all three levels of the field and can win versus man can win versus zone and is shown to be a much more complete receiver i think there is an argument that potentially brian thomas has a higher ceiling just because he can be that x but i think in terms of day one who's the more all-rounded complete receiver it's it's xavier worthy by a long way yeah we're definitely fans of xavier worthy here in the sanctuary uh Let's move on to another play. I, I, I gotta say, I love it because it's I and I don't always know what to expect. Like people usually like him, but a lot of people are. I don't want to say they're down on Xavier Worthy, but I feel like they're definitely underrating him. I think the thing with Xavier Worthy, and we saw it straight after the combine, where everybody rolled out the tweets about, okay, oh, every every fast player has you know struggled to succeed. Henry Ruggs, Josh, John, John Ross, and all that. But it just falls down so quickly when you look at what Xavier Worthy's done as a college player. Like I don't watch college. During season, I'm too busy with DFS on Saturdays for the Sunday slates. But it's so easy for me to look at his stats and go, okay, what he did as a freshman and then what he's done at different levels of the field is clearly sustainable success and the kind of stuff that can, as long as he doesn't end up with a complete doll of an offensive coordinator, he's going to be fine at the next level. Uh, another player who is kind of going in that kind of similar range and again, a player with quite a wide range of outcomes i'd say is troy franklin rich your model really likes troy franklin uh wide receiver three i think in one of one of those players who pops in yards per team pass attempt breakout age which is in your model we've talked in other videos though about how he's not a particularly polished route runner and that's something which the models don't take into account is franklin someone who's going to be very draft capital dependent for you as to where you'd be willing to rank them in a month's time. Yeah, I think I think the the comment about route running, I think he runs a few routes well. I think his problem is is that he he can be knocked off routes by physical corners. And I think he has good body control, but struggles with body control at the catch point. So I think that there are some bits to like but I almost need him to be a 1B in the NFL rather than a 1A because I don't think he's going to be able to lead a receiving core. Analytically, you know, he he ticks a lot of the boxes in terms of my PPR breakout age, um, things like touchdowns per game. Obviously, he's a very young prospect. The Ripter, he's a little bit lighter. Um, which is is where it sort of dings him slightly. But yeah, if if he gets day one draft capital, which I think is potential, I think he's going to be a, a solid kind of mid to back end first round pick in rookie drafts. Yeah. Uh, Dwayne, out of your top 14 wide receivers, I think it was, Franklin kind of gets the biggest knock on your program quality index, but he also has a really high re uh, result for QB rating when targeted. So, how much of a concern is that program quality score for you, particularly when you consider how good he was when targeted? Yeah. So once like we get the actual NFL draft capital, the value of program quality, you know, goes down. It's really helping you like heading into the draft and kind of validating where mock draft and that kind of thing is at. like, it still matters. Um, so ahead of the NFL draft. Yeah. It's, it's holding him down a little bit, but overall, like when I look at, Troy Franklin, he's just one of these guys, you know, he was a highly recruited guy. He was four or five stars, but, you know, he was towards the top of the four star recruits, one of the top guys in his class. And, you know, he just came to a program that, you know, loves to throw the ball. He landed in this really great spot. And like, it was just like, it was good, but it wasn't great. 
And so when you look at his production, you know, uh, you talked about the RIPTA. So the adjusted career RIPTA index, which, like I said, waits for all the things like average depth of target, quality of quarterback, your teammates, and then your age. He came in at the 59th percentile, which is a tad lie. It's not bad. Like, that's still good. Um, but when he did get his opportunities, like the 86th percentile and career targeted quarterback rating index, like you mentioned, Tom, that is a big plus. So when I'm creating inputs into the model one, I'm looking for things that correlate strongly to future fantasy success. And then I'm looking for things that while they may have overlap, like there's also they're diverse, right? They're different than one another. And so I'm always testing all the variables in the model against one another from that aspect. And I think it's a good blend to put with something like Ripta because Ripta is really team context, right? It's what you do divided by your team's passing attempts and the games that you played in. Whereas career targeted quarterback rating kind of gives us a glimpse into, well, like when they did get their targets, they were really good. And it makes sense because if you think about what goes into a quarterback rating, oh, touchdowns matter, interceptions matter, incompletions, completions, all those things matter. So it's just enough different, you know, because Ripta is pretty much just depending on your targets and, and yards from a context that I do like it. And it was showed to be a really favorable pairing to put those two things together to help balance one another out. Um, but still, like, ultimately the model cares more about Ripta. So <laughs> while the targeted quarterback rating index does help out, Troy Franklin more the reason the main reason like he's not scoring higher in the model is is his Ripta but I, I th I'm pretty much on I'm in I'm in line in alignment with Rich um I don't know that he could never be a wide receiver one and and if he landed in the right spot with somebody that really understood his strengths and wanted to wrap the scheme around him but just luck of the draw land with any head coach or any offensive coordinator, I do think he's a guy that probably looks better, you know, as a number two. Like in my model, though, even without draft capital, 37% uh, of the guys that grade in his range have had at least a top 36 finish. That's not winning your fantasy league, but there is a decent floor. And then 32% of them have had a top 24 finish. 16% have gone on to have a top 12 finish. So there, there's still some upside there, but I think overall, like Rich is hitting it like pretty accurately. It, I would be pretty surprised, like, if he turns into a top end wide receiver one, I see him more as even in fantasy. Like I think what you're hoping for when you draft him is, can he be a low end wide receiver too? So I'll, I'll first question to both of you, but um, Rich, you can weigh in first, but he's being projected to go around pick 34. We know Carolina picking at 33 need more wide receivers. Is Troy Franklin the kind of ideal player to be a wide receiver two behind Deontay Johnson? Or is there another landing spot in that range you'd prefer more? No, I mean, look, first of all, we know that I've got a blind spot when it comes to Jonte Johnson. So perhaps I can't answer this question fairly, but well, I'd, I'd right, love I that landing that spot. together. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd love the pairing because I think Jonte Johnson is that undersized receiver, but he's a true X. You know, he's everybody wants to get away from him, but he lines up as an X often. He lines up on the outside. He can beat press coverage and he can be that kind of target leader, which will al allow Troy Franklin to settle into his natural role as the Z and be that deep threat Z that will complement Jonte Johnson working underneath and the intermediate area of the field. I think that would be an absolute perfect pairing. Obviously, you've then got to throw in, is it the right play caller? Is it the right uh, quarterback? All that kind of thing. But I think in terms of just a pure 1A, 1B wide receiver pairing, Franklin and Johnson, purely for Franklin, would be a perfect kind of guy to go and line up opposite. How about you, Dwayne? Any thoughts on Franklin landing spot? Yeah, I think that would be okay. I mean, when you look at, you know, the the draft, there's a lot of teams there that could be the main thing you want is somewhere that just doesn't have a ton of target earners already on the team. Then you kind of let the chips fall where they may. Um, you know, if you can get an innovative play caller, I think that definitely helps. But obviously the Chargers really I mean, if we believe all the smoke screens, like it sounds like they're not gonna take uh a wide receiver at their pick, and that would make sense with uh Harbaugh. So if they take an offensive tackle then I would be okay with the Chargers still. Uh, I, I That might put a little more pressure on him to be the number one, but you get to play with Justin Herbert. Josh Palmer is okay, but not a great player. Quentin Johnson obviously was a, a major bust so far in his career, so I would be okay with that as well. Um, schematically, might be a little tough. I mean, will Harbaugh pull the trigger on a player like that that's probably not going to be the greatest run blocker? I don't know if he would, but like it's a pretty clear runway. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of go back and look at 
some of the wide receivers who've been around, Greg Roman, perhaps you'd say, okay, well, Marquise Brown was never particularly a good run blocker, but he was somebody that the Ravens I had to saw. rotate a lot because of that. Like, yeah, early on. it was it was so frustrating because you're like, can we get this guy like a 90 percent route particip- participation instead <laughs> of like games where it's like 65 and 70? But yeah, definitely the charges are going to be very interesting for sure. If you're enjoying all this talk about rookies, hit the join button down below. For our silver tier membership, you get Rich's rookie guide, almost 200 pages of content on these rookies, the full rookie wide receiver model, which will be updated after the draft. You also get a host of other dynasty content, including Rich's trade values, trade calculators, and much more, as well as access to our Discord. It will absolutely get you set up to win this year. Uh, Jacob Cowing. Dwayne, when I look at your model, Jacob Cowing's probably one of the most interesting players when you flip back and forth on the different inputs to see which players pop where. He had 1.8 career adjusted receiving yards per team pass attempts, ripped her as we're calling it, which is a massive number, you know, higher than Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors. But his program quality index of 5% is incredibly low. Do you think that this is going to be one of those tales of a small school player who had enough quality to be able to put it all together? Or is this just one of those situations where we go, okay, we've seen lots of players come out of these small schools and they're just not able to dominate in the NFL in the way they were at a small school like Arizona? Yeah, look, I mean, he mostly played from the slot. You know, he's a guy that, you know, he's older. He's 23.6. He'll he'll be 23.6 when the NFL season starts. So almost 24 years old. He is small. I think he's more like when people originally were saying Lad McConkey was just this underneath slot receiver. Like you clearly know, like, no, they haven't looked at any of the data. You're like, well, one, he played outside to go look at all the areas of the field he attacked. But when you say it about a guy like Cowing, like he really is a traditional slot wide receiver. And the thing that's pushing him up is ripped a period. 83rd percentile, you mentioned how high it is. It is one of the highest marks that we've seen in the model. But all the other things are low. Like he was a two of five star recruit. Um, you know, so if he doesn't get, you know, any draft capital, it's really going to hurt him. And landing spot really matters for slot wide receivers. I mean, we see it come and go. Hunter Renfro is a good slot wide receiver, but when does it work out? Only when you have someone willing to run 11 personnel all the time and just let him run around in the slot. You know, that didn't happen you know, after John Gruden left. And so it's it's one of those scenarios where with Cowan, he's going to have to absolutely hit gold from a landing spot standpoint. But I do believe, like looking at his profile, even though he's older, there's a lot of things we don't like. If he, if he does hit that, like if he finds the exact right landing spot where they want to have a quick passing game, that maybe they don't have a very good tight end to compete with him for targets and it's something where they just want him to be that guy, you know, running the whip routes, all that kind of stuff. Kind of like what Wes, Wes Welker used to do back in the day. Obviously, that's an elite version. Like, it's really hard to do what Wes Welker would, but did. But think, like, he had a quarterback in Tom Brady that wanted to get the hand, get the ball out of his hands fast. He had other weapons that could stretch out the field. It was in a pass-first offense. Like, that's the kind of concoction, like, Cowing's going to need. Otherwise, like, it's going to be really tough for him to really do anything at the next level. But, I mean, just to get, give the guy a hat, a hat tip, like uh, a really good player in college as far as Ripta's is concerned, and the model cares about that. Yeah, R- R- Rich, what's your kind of feelings on Jacob Cowing? Is he a player popping for you in your model? Yeah, I mean, he, he absolutely pops. I think he's he's fascinating because you look at his early career when he was at UTEP and, you know, crazy, crazy deep A dot, you know, sort of as that speed slot and then goes to Arizona and is almost used completely differently underneath. I think his A dot was around six this last year. It's really weird for a player to do those two completely different roles but also command the insane volume that he did, you know, targets per route run over 25% every single year of his college career. I think draft capital is going to be absolutely massive because as Dwayne said, he is not a player that you can just plug and play and say, right, go out, run, run these routes with you're good. This is your role. You need to, if he is going to be successful fancy, create a role for him in your offense and the only way that's going to happen is if he gets decent draft capital and the only way that will happen is if he gets drafted on day two if he doesn't i just don't think this type of player this type of profile is the kind of person that you can put any sort of expectation breaking out because he is so limited in terms of, as Dwayne said, the usage, the slot only, the size. And he's a guy like, that's, it won't surprise me at all if like he's around 
six pick. Like he could be undrafted even potentially. Oh, like, I think he probably gets drafted, but like I, I just I think draft capital is gonna be a, a challenge. Yeah, and I think that's it. Is that the only saving grace for someone like Cowing is if 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 some coach somewhere falls in love with him and says he is perfect for us to go and do this X Y and Z, and we're gonna build a role for him. That's the only world in which I can see myself drafting him as much as he pops analytically, just because. As you said, he he is a very niche, specific type of player. It it sounds like what you kind of lean into is that unless he gets that good sort of top sixty, top sixty five draft capital, that he's probably going to end up being the kind of player who's a dynasty roster clogger. He's going to be sat on your bench a lot. You're never going to know when to start him, but you're never going to want to cut him either. So. Yeah, definitely landing he, capital. He's on a team like he could be a third or fourth rounder, and it could make him worse stashing if he lands on a team that has a good quarterback that's pass first that wants to run a lot of, of eleven personnel. And you see, and when you squint, you're like, "Hey, I see a slot. I see a path to him taking the slot role over quickly." You know, I think it would also mean you can't have two other really great outside wide receivers. Well, as you notice, like we're creating a lot of criteria right off the bat of all the <laughs> things you're going to need. That's not always a good sign because like ask me about Brock Bowers and I'm like, I don't care. Like just put him somewhere like he's probably going to end up being good. Yeah, we'd rather him play somewhere that doesn't have a lot of target competition. But anytime I find myself having to say if he lands in this exact kind of role, that's usually a red flag. So uh, how much college uh, games do you watch? Dwayne, do you watch it in season? I know you're in Texas. Man, I don't watch it in season because I, yeah. I just I can't. Um, there, there's so much going on, like with NFL and and our content schedule, and then I have a family, so I catch up on it all in the off season. I watch all of these players, but I really, honestly, don't let my and I've watched a lot of film and stuff over the years, but I don't I don't let my film thoughts and stuff really bleed too much in the work. Like I may add a comment you'll see written up as to what I think about the player and something I saw, but mostly I lean into the other experts in the community, especially ones where I know I've tested their data behind the scenes to see like what's their correlation to future fantasy success. And there, there are people out there that are really good at this. So I really try to blend what I'm doing from an analytical style and then look at what they're doing from a film style, because I do really think you need both of those things. But honestly, not, I don't mean this to sound bad, but 99% of the time when I hear a fantasy analyst talking about what they saw on film, I'm like, you probably don't know what you're talking about. It's not that you don't know football or you don't know what you're watching and it's fun to do it, but it's like that. It's the Malcolm Gladwell kind of thing. Tipping point, you know, 10, I mean, 10,000 hours, right. Or outliers was the book. 10,000 hours is what it takes to be an expert. These people that are watching film that are really good at it, you know how they're good at it because they know what matters. They know what doesn't matter. Like a lot of times when I'm listening to people and like after I've kind of looked at what the really good film people are saying, I'm like, you're talking about a lot of stuff that probably doesn't even matter. And I think that's just, it can happen. You hear people doing it with the analytics stuff as well. Um, you know, so I, I, I watch it, but I don't really let what I see play a huge role in how I grade these players out in the model. I'm much more likely to look at what someone else has said about them that I trust um, from a film perspective. So I, I'll throw this out to you Dwayne and then Rich after you. but like when you see stats like this for Jacob Cowing that really stand out in comparison to other wide receivers and yes you know that it's it's not one of the top tier colleges how how does that weigh into your process do you become particularly excited to like dive deeper into it do you feel like does that become a priority to you to work out where this came from? Or is it something which, you know, we just, we do see these year to year and you just have to be quite blase about it. You know, the answers will come out in the wash as you get through the data. I pretty much follow the same process for every player. Like I've got a checklist that I'm working to regardless of what like their data tells me, but I obviously get excited you know, because we're doing this work and I see things like that, it makes me excited to get to the process for that player. So anytime I see something like this, like the next step, like once you see that, as I then break down the data on what it looked like and against man and zone coverage, then I break down, like, were they able to attack and be targeted at all layers of the field? Because the more, the more diverse your profile is, the more ways you can fit an NFL team the more narrow that becomes doesn't mean you couldn't still be good in the future in the exact kind of role that we're talking about. And, and that's what this conversation around cowing is kind of wrapped around that axle, but like you have less outs 
like your landing spot really has to matter. So once I see something like that, even if that number's low, the, the next step in the process is always, okay, well, great. Well, how are they against the different types of coverage? How were they at earning targets at all these different areas of the field? How good were they when they were targeted? Maybe you had a ton of target volume, but did you really add a lot of value to your team? So all of those things become factors. But but yes, when you see a smaller name like this that you weren't expecting, and they have a big number like that that you know matters in your model, you can't ha help but like you see the bright blue or green, whatever kind of chart you're looking at, and your eye goes to it. And you're like, oh man, I can't wait to get to that guy and really like go through my process. How about you, Rich? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, you know, basically echoing what Dwayne said in terms of whenever something like that pops, it, it causes me to go back and look at more, you know, whether it's a case of putting the film back on and, and seeing, you know, I, I was just talking with Matt on our uh, Sleepers show that was, will be released next week. Whenever, you know, a, someone at the Combine does something differently or there's a stat that pops or something like that, that causes me to go, okay, did I see something differently are they a different type of player to what I'm seeing this stat say or this combine performance say? And, and it'll always lead me back to, you know, diving in more and sort of reanalyzing it as such to, to see if, if what I'm seeing is real or, or it's just kind of a, a number that's popping, but perhaps doesn't carry much weight. Well, speaking of players that we kind of sometimes need to dive in a bit more. So we've got Malik Washington, five-year player out of Virginia, Four years of little to mediocre returns before kind of exploded in year five, 111 catches, 1,300 yards, nine touchdowns last year. Rich, in your rookie uh, guide, you called him a prototypical slot receiver, thrives on quickness and ability to separate, but he does get dinged in your model for a lack of touchdowns per game. How much do you feel like when you look at this player, Malik Washington, what he does can translate to the NFL or is this going to be another player where we start going okay well he's going to need this to happen this to happen this to happen for his landing spot in order to be someone that we should be drafting this year yeah I think for, first of all when you say he gets dinged for touchdowns I think he, he scored four touchdowns in his first 40 college games like I think we need to identify how how few touchdowns he scored before we move on um I think it's you know we're going back to what Dwayne was saying earlier anytime I'm looking at a guy and saying okay I don't think he can play outside. It, it it raises questions because as soon as you become slot only, you're you're needing those boxes to be ticked in order to find a role. So yeah, I, I, it's always going to raise concerns. The fact that you know age adjusted production is a, a big part of the model, and as you said, he yeah he played at Northwestern for four years and and didn't really do much until the last stage of his career there before blowing up massively this year. So. Yeah, I, I am concerned about a, a prospect and a profile like Washington. Dwayne, how about for you? I, I know in your model I've got there on screen from fantasylife.com, there's just there's a whole sea of red, really. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Is he a player that you've been tempted at all to take in early best ball drafts or anything to take any kind of dart throw shots on? No, but I will say, like, he's a great example of why I don't, trust my film watching like too much because when i watch malik washington he's just freaking fun to watch <laughs> like if you <laughs> watch his last year like how can you not enjoy malik washington you you they're, they're, it's not possible i would say like this guy for the size he is the way he plays uh his ability after the catch i mean he he makes some pretty good players look silly but just too many things in the model and remember this model it's created really it's shaped to the norms right what are the things that normally make a wide receiver successful in the nfl and sometimes i think that makes people mad but it's just, if you just recognize that that's what the model is and then you use it for what it is we're just playing a game of probability we want to hit on percentages and i would say malik washington is a low percentage play but having said that there are always outliers to the model and when i watch malik washington i'm like I could see why people would think he would be an outlier. Like he's just a fun player to watch. So a, a lot of the same things Rich said, but like just, you know, age 23 before he really got there, you know, even if we're giving him a year off for COVID, I mean, it was his fifth year in college. Didn't really do much early. Didn't do anything early. Didn't do anything big until the end. I know a lot of people say, well, that's when he finally got a quarterback. Well, as soon as we start making all these excuses, I'm sorry. And the model, that's a big reason in the model, I've got an adjustment for quarterback play. Um, so it, it, even accounting for all of those things, his age, all those things against him, he still didn't do well in the model. Now, 
when I watch him, do I think, man, maybe the model didn't do enough for a player like this? Yes. The problem is as soon as you start trying to calibrate your model to handle exceptions that might happen, especially before they've ever even happened, like you're just getting on a really slippery slope. So I just want to put it out there that watching Malik Washington, I get it. I really like the player. I've read some good write-ups from people uh, that I trust, but I do think to Rich's point, he is a slot receiver and we're getting back to that Jacob Cowing kind of thing to where he's going to have to have the, the exact right landing spot. If he does it, if he hits the nuts, like on his landing spot, like then I would say he is a guy that could surprise us. Well, let's move on to a non-slot type player. A.D. Mitchell out of Texas. I mean, his stats, when you compare him to Xavier Worthy, they pale, you know, 0.17 career adjusted receiving yards per team pass attempt compared to Worthy's 1.39. But they're going in a similar range in mock drafts. I heard Adam Schefter on Established Runs podcast this week say that he wouldn't be surprised if A.D. Mitchell went in the sort of low 20s, high teens range of the draft. So we know that quarterback play also wasn't a strength at Texas this year, but we've had good players come out of there. Dwayne, are you willing to ignore any of the stats on Mitchell and just draft him kind of ahead of where he's been going or project him to be do better than sort of the model expects? Or do you feel like there, there are some concerns that we're right to sort of lean into? Look, I think he's the most overrated wide receiver in the draft. <laughs> I don't know how this player is a first round pick. I really don't. We've seen AD Mitchell before. Now, look, there are people that do film that I, I get it. I hear them talk ab about the way that AD Mitchell moves. And I tried to think through those things, but at the same time, like your inability to ever really have a huge season period. Um, you know, you've got the pedigree, you went to Georgia, you end up transferring over to Texas, but again, like in my model, I'm accounting for bad quarterback play. I'm accounting for the fact you had to compete with Xavier worthy and Jatavion Sanders for, uh, you know, targets. I'm accounting for the fact that you were a down the field target, which is going to increase your contested catch rate and all those sort of things. So it's like the models kind of made to make sure a player like this doesn't like get overly dinged and he still just shows up really bad in the model. Now I have gone and watched him play and I get it. I think the problem is like, show me when AD Mitchell has consistently done these things. He seems to be the kind of player that he, when he has his moment and he's like, I'm going to turn it on today. I've got to play against the best cornerback in the league and I'm going to go put this film on and everybody in the draft process is going to fall in love with me, love me because of that. Like we had Trevor Sykema on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago and Trevor's an awesome analyst for over at PFF and he loves AD Mitchell. Like he, I mean, he thinks that like he has got the rare tools that give him this super high ceiling. My challenge is like go back and try to look for, look at players like AD Mitchell that were size speed freaks that honestly did nothing. In college, I can't find examples that worked out. I mean, Rich, maybe you have, and I'm hoping you, if you're an analytical person that can tell me AD Mitchell's good, I'm honestly looking for one. Is there a person that is an analytically minded person that can tell me AD Mitchell is good? Because like, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I think he's a raw size speed prospect. How are we talking about this guy as a first round pick? I, I agree a hundred percent. I think he. I you he, had a good answer for me, man. No, I, I, I <laughs> tell I'm me I'm an gonna, idiot. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't get it. I, I just, you know, there's, there's no age just production. Even when you put on the film, I don't. I see flashes, but I think it's, it's more style over substance. It's the big over exaggerated head fakes to create separation rather than just creating separation naturally but i mean yeah if you look at it analytically he's like below 25th percentile in riptar he's below uh, well he's 12th percentile in target share per game like it, it's just not a player that commanded volume and production at the college level and whenever you're going to put him into a production-based model a guy that didn't produce is going to struggle so yeah I, I i don't see it i don't get it the idea of taking him over Xavier Worthy, I, I find absolutely mad. Yeah, I guess the thing is, yeah, they're production-based models to an extent, but really only because we're following the data trail of what are things that correlate to future production. Oh, this dirty little thing we call fantasy points, but whatever. <laughs> you want to call it receiving yards and touchdowns? Uh, like, like not you, but like some people do that. <laughs> you know, they'll be like, based on what metrics? I'm like, ah, oh, you know, yards, catches. 
aka fantasy points. Like we're really all <laughs> wanting the same thing from these guys. <laughs> but like we get ourselves in a pretzel, like just to act like, oh, I'm not talking about fantasy. Um, but like with Mitchell, like here are the closest comps. So like if you look at it, and like 25% of his targets came 20 plus yards down the field. So I get it. He could be a guy that could stretch the field out for you. Um, he wasn't, you know, a high end target earner, but he was good when he was getting those targets, 519 yards and eight touchdowns over his career on those targets, 20 plus yards down the field. But here's the challenge. So while that he being a deep threat size, those things are really good and you can find a niche role on a team, having someone like that turn into the archetype of player, which what is what you should be looking for in a round one NFL pick. In my opinion, I'm not running a franchise. Um, like the closest comps I could find for him. And I had to drop draft capital out of it because it's impossible. Um, but Marquez Valdez, Gantling and miles Boykin, uh, MVS had a 31st percentile adjusted career Ripta coming out of USF Boykin had a 16th percentile at Notre Dame. And if you look at the relative athletic scores, which people fall in love with the Raz, um, the, the Boykin Adonai Mitchell's really close. So the average collegiate wide receiver in Mitchell's a dot range, like not even focusing on, you know, uh, talents that made it to the NFL, just, just period looking at college players, they are 1.52 receiving yards per pass attempt. Like when you look at Mitchell, he's 14% below that at 1.30. So even after like calibrating for like the exact role he played and giving him all the excuses in the world, I, I can't, I, I can't find a way to love him. And the closest comps I can find are MVS and Boykin, which is not good. And you've just comped into two of Tom's favorite players ever. So I guess we're going to see Tom draft a lot of A.D. Mitchell. Tom, let's get some A.D. Mitchell, baby. Well, I, I just let you say, I definitely didn't ever draft much Miles Boykin, but I was definitely excited <laughs> for him based on all the analytical stuff that was being hyped up about him. And yeah, he definitely fell flat on his face. And uh, I mean, just never got on the same page. It's funny, as though, even really. when you hear film people talk about this, Oh, he's fast. He can he can hit the deep area of the field. What is, what are NFL teams not letting you do on defense anymore? Attack the deep area of the field. Okay, so has okay, great. And then it is oh, but he's really fast and he did well at the combine. What's something for receivers that we pretty much know? I don't want to say it has zero signal because NFL teams care about it. It goes into draft capital, but there's not a huge signal in anything in the combine or Raz when you when you really look towards correlating to future fantasy production yards receptions those sort of things yeah the vertical is nice so i don't mind if somebody puts that in their model but it's mostly things that we've already tested out in the past to say like these are not optimal things and now these are the things that we care so much about with ad mitchell so even like if he hits like can he be more than a role player like i i don't know like i just again i get i get real worked up about ad mitchell so i mean Miles Boykin and Marquez Valdez Scantling kind of gives us the perfect segue to talk about avoiding busts. Like, we know that the analytics isn't foolproof. You know, we've seen Traylon yeah. Burks, Rashad Bateman, and even Quentin Johnston most recently. Kind of, there were reasons why they looked okay analytically, but then it just hasn't translated. I think Quentin Johnston, we were all a little skeptical about. Traylon Burks obviously got real elite draft capital when the Titans kind of panic drafted him after moving on from AJ Brown during that draft. Dwayne, through the kind of years of looking at the data that you've done, is there any analytical red flags that you've started to be a little bit wary of that you perhaps weren't a couple of years ago? Yeah. Uh, well, and that's why every year, like I'm back to the drawing board on this stuff, trying to test new variables, find new data. Um, you know, I spent basically a month doing that before I started you know, iterating and building the models again this year and then doing my writing. So it's a, it's a part of the year that I really love and enjoy. And I try to be super open-minded about it, you know, and just finding new ways to improve on the process like this year. And I'll be honest with you, Rich, most things I research, Tom dead ends. <laughs> <laughs> I finished like three or four hours better. of research and uh, I'm like, yeah, there's nothing. But I've crossed it off the list. I find out that it means absolutely nothing, or I think there's something, and then I test it against the other variables that I know are strong in my model. I'm like, oh, wow, great. There's like 80% overlap between those two things. Why didn't I think of that before I just spent four hours on it? But I do find things occasionally, like the ADOT adjustments this year, the quarterback play adjustments. Those help the model take a step forward. And those are the kind of things that I, a lot of those come from, 
like these prospects where I look back and feel like I didn't have a perfect way to gauge them. There's never a perfect way, but I didn't have a good enough way to gauge them because there were these little things like, oh, they had a really crappy quarterback, right? Or, oh, they were stuck in this kind of role, but they could be more. And a lot of this comes from lis listening and chatting with people that watch way more film than me. And they tell me these things. So I'm like, oh, I bet there's data where I could. And so I'm jotting this stuff down. Every time I talk to somebody that's like kick ass at film, and that's my list, you know, for the next season. And occasionally I do really come across things, um, you know, so honestly, like the biggest next step I want to do is really go way wider and broader on researching who's really good at film work. It's going to be included in the running back model this year. Uh, I have to give a hat tip. Lance Zierlein from NFL.com. People give that guy a ton of shit. But this guy grades over 500 prospects every year. Right. He doesn't just get to focus on the fantasy guys like we do. He's doing freaking offensive linemen, safeties, all of it. I tested his running back scores. You have to find someone that does scores. It can't just be their ranks, right? Because it's it, nothing's linear. We know there's gaps and tiers in these things, but he gives a score to these players every year. It's available, it's online. So I went all the way back to 2017. I pulled it into my model. I tested it. His grades, this is a guy just watching film. 0.59 correlation to future fantasy production. That's really good. NFL draft pick is 0.58. He beat that. So that's that's my next step. I want to find like who the experts are. And I've already like I've already started scoping it out. I've done some of the work, but I wasn't confident enough in some of it to add it to wide receiver and tight end this year, like with where I was. But for running back, I did include it into the model. And um, so I I think where you can bring film and you bring, you know, the, the more data driven side of it together. I, th I think that's like where the future is for me, but like, uh, I know I've gone on without answering your exact question. I think I've answered it in a roundabout way, but yeah, yeah like it's, it's a little great. The, the big flags were quarterback play, not being able to evaluate those people, uh, guys that are overly dependent on scheme. Um, that's pushing up their targets per their, their target share, um, pushing up their Ripta, those things like that, playing from the slot, or maybe a ton of their targets come behind the line of scrimmage. All those, if that's all they can rely on, that is a red flag. If it's a player that does that and then they also get the targets at the other area of the field, that can actually be a positive because that just means, oh, you're a guy you can get the ball to at the line of scrimmage, or I can run you deep down the field or intermediate. So I would say, you know, guys getting all their touches in a schemed way. And then also figuring out how to handle quarterbacks with really bad quarterback play. Traylon Burks was one of those. If you guys remember his quarterback, if you watched any of that, you could clearly see like there was a good chance like his quarterback couldn't start at the high school that's close to you. Uh, was well, probably wasn't going to be possible. Might, might be over here in England, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> I don't know, it. man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, R Rich has played more than I have, uh, so I'll leave that one to him. But Rich, uh, how about you? I know you've kind of refined things in your model a little bit. Is there anything that you're particularly excited to see how it plays out across this year that you've added in there and taken more weight in with? No, I think um, I've I've kind of adjusted weightings on a few things. I think. Um, Touchdowns per game has has seen an increase in in waiting for me this year. Yeah, that's in mine too, and it had been yeah. out for a while. Uh, and I do total touchdowns per game just so you can catch like their receiving. I need to add special teams to it, but just like their overall. Any any way you can add something that adds breadth. But sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But touchdowns per game is one that had not been in my model for a little while because I retest everything every year and it made it back in uh, for running back and for wide receiver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I retested it. It was in in previous years, but I've given it a kind of a, a bigger emphasis. And it it's kind of weird, but it just so happens that basically all of the guys that have busted in recent years have been slightly lower in that metric in terms of Quinton Johnston, Sky Moore, Traylon Burks, all those sort of players have been lower than the guys that have produced that were going around them in terms of the model and, and ADP and things like that. So, yeah, it, it, I, I'm intrigued to see how it does, uh, particularly this year. Well, that'll do it for us. I mean, if by now you haven't been over to fantasylife.com, do so now. Go and read all the articles that Dwayne's put out, give him the context on the players, the tiers of his rankings and how he sees these players. Hit the join button below, hit the subscribe button. You'll be able to get a copy of Rich's Rookie Guide. So much more. We'll help you crush your drafts in 2024 and we will be back very, very soon.